Good afternoon. This is Roxanne of the Ohio EPA's um, DER. Thank you for joining us today for the well development training. Today's session, well development training, is provided by Jeff Martin from DER. Jeff Martin has been employed by the Ohio EPA since 2000, working four years in drinking and groundwater, four years in DIMWIM, and 12 years in DER, where he is currently serves as the program administrator for geologists and groundwater staff. Prior to Ohio EPA, he worked in the private sector for 12 years as a geologist in environmental consulting, water supply, and mining sectors. He earned a bachelor's in science in geology from Ohio University in 1985 and a master's degree in geology with a minor in geophysics from North Carolina State University in 1990. He is currently licensed as a professional geologist in North Carolina and Pennsylvania and is a member of the American Institute of Professional Geologists. With that said, please give Jeff full attention as they begin the session. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, again, this is Jeff Martin. I hope everyone's having a good afternoon. Today's presentation is monitoring well development, and we're going to talk about uh, five topics, the purpose of monitoring well development, the factors that affect well development, the time interval between well installation and development, procedures, criteria, and documentation, the time interval between development and sampling, and redevelopment. Next slide, please. So our primary objective for collect for a groundwater sample is that it's representative. We want that sample to represent what is in the subsurface. And it would be great if we could somehow magically, without installing a well or sampling, we could just somehow reach down into the earth and pull out the water as it is without any effects uh, of the atmosphere or, or, or drilling or well installation, but we can't do that. We've got to install monitoring wells to collect groundwater samples or some type of similar device. And when we install a monitoring well, we damage the formation, and it ad which adversely affects natural conditions in the saturated zone. Uh, for example, uh, we can decrease our saturated zone yield adjacent to the well, essentially reduce the hydraulic con conductivity or permeability of the formation. Uh, we can cause increased particulate matter and groundwater turbidity, which is an issue of concern. And then there's various changes that can occur in groundwater chemistry due to the increased turbidity, aeration and oxidation, degassing, or addition to drilling fluids. And all these things basically will tend to make our sample not representative. So we want to find out, or we want, we need to take some type of step to reverse that damage and those processes which cause non-representativeness. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We, we develop the well, and the purpose is to stress, and by stress I mean surge and purge the well and surrounding formation. So surging and purging is simply pushing water in, in through the screen, out into the formation, and then pulling it back out and, and removing water from the well. And this action creates a graded filter pack. We'll talk about why that's important and what that is later. And we want to remove particulate matter and fluid from the well installation. In other words, those things that we added to the subsurface, we want to take away. And an analogy I might use, and this might not be the greatest analogy in the world, but I think it's kind of appropriate, is a new house. Say you bought, built yourself a new house, right? And the contractor calls you and they say, well, the house is done. You know, the siding's up, the basement's finished. Uh, all the uh, the electricals in, the plumbing's in, and you go to see your new house, and you walk in, and there's drywall dust on the floor, and pieces of two by four maybe laying around. Things are kind of dirty. The windows are dirty. You know, the sink needs cleaned out. You don't have any appliances. There's no blinds or carpet. It isn't painted the way you want it. Even though the house is constructed, you could say it's constructed. It's really not finished. You need to do some cleaning and some fixing up. Uh, to get it ready to live. And, and this is like a well. I mean, when a well is installed, it's not necessarily ready for its intended use. We need to try to revert, reverse formation damage, clean up the well, uh, maybe try to make the well a little bit better in terms of its ability uh, to transmit water uh, from the formation so we don't have head loss. So that's kind of an analogy I thought might be helpful for people that don't know a lot about water development or are new to this, this uh, this particular area of uh, investigation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So proper well development ensures good hydraulic communication between the well and surrounding formation. We want to minimize head loss. In other words, we want the hydraulic head in the well to be the same as that in the formation. We don't want to have a lower or higher head in the well because of uh, something, you know, like if, if uh, we reduce the permeability in the vicinity of the well, we could end up having a lower uh, head in the well itself. And the other thing we want to do is enhance the well yield. We want to get the best yield that we can. Uh, we want to restore and stabilize groundwater chemistry to the extent that we can. And really important is to still facilitate the collection of low turbidity groundwater samples. Next slide. So when we, we're considering reduction in stability of turbidity by well development, that helps us to ensure collection of groundwater samples that are representative. And really what we're concerned about here are metals in particular. Because if we have water that's turbid because of the way the well was installed or it wasn't properly developed, we could get non-representative metal concentrations. The metal concentrations would be higher than they would be in the groundwater itself because you would be sampling the turbidity, which is fine particles, particulates of silt and things with metals attached to those particles or incorporated in those particles. So th that's a big issue there. And we want to minimize the silting of the well screen interval. In other words, we don't want to install a well, let's say in a silty formation, and then later on have a problem of silt continuously entering the well as we're sampling or purging it. We want to try to remove that silt uh, before we really put the well into its use or intended use. Now, a big uh, uh, important point, and I'll make this point again, sample filtration is never a substitute for well development. You know, we have consultants out there that will sometimes say, well, yeah, I know the well is going to be a little turbid or we didn't develop it or we didn't develop it enough, but we'll just filter the samples and that'll take care of it. There's a whole range of issues with filtration of a sample. And again, if you think about it, filtration, you don't want to use it as a, 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 as a way to correct a, another problem. You want to solve the problem, which is the well needs developed, okay? Uh, filtration, there are certain concerns with it in terms of a representative sample. We would prefer not to ever filter samples if we could, because uh, you know things can happen like the filter itself could affect the groundwater sample adversely. Uh, you know, you may filter out particles from the groundwater that you actually want in the sample, colloidal particles, which are are very very small particles, but they travel effectively with flow in a subsurface. So we, we want to be very careful about how we apply filtration. And it's certainly never a substitute for good well development. And having said that, we need to realize that some monitoring wells are really difficult to develop. If we have wells installed in clay-rich sediments like till or clustering sediments, it might be hard to develop the well at a point where we do get a, a sample that's, that, that's non-turbid, or at least a turbidity that, that's, that's sufficiently low that we wouldn't have to filter. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, yeah, so factors of, uh, affecting well development activities. So we've got six considerations here. The intended use of the well, the property hydrogeology, the drilling method, the monitoring well design, non-aqueous phase liquids, and other considerations. The so next slide. So the intended use of the well. Now, the environmental industry borrowed well development techniques from the water supply industry in the late 1980s and early 90s. Uh, if you remember that time, Superfund and Record were up and rolling. Uh, you know, there was a lot of large sites that were being addressed. Uh, pump and treat was a very popular remediation method. So the idea of well development comes from uh, the water supply industry, which they always develop water supply wells. And usually it can be a fairly intense development uh, for, for, for that type of an application. But the important thing here we need to recognize is we talk about wells, we have water supply versus monitoring versus remediation versus aquifer testing. Those are all different uses. Now we might you know, use a well for monitoring aquifer testing, that's true. But the selected development activity should be adequate to prepare the well for whatever its intended use is. For example, if we have a monitoring well that needs to produce samples of representative contaminant concentrations, we need to make sure that our development gets us to that point, right? If we decide that the turbidity needs to be less than 50 NTUs at all costs to avoid issues with metals, that's what we need to do. 
a well installed for water supply or remediation pumping. The, the, the uh, intended use is different in the type of development, duration of development, intensity of development uh, might also be different. Okay, next slide. So property hydrogeology, we've got basically two groups of geologic materials. We have consolidated materials or bedrock and then unconsolidated geologic materials. And we can break those down into coarse grain sediments, which are sand and gravel outwash, or fine grain sediments, which are clay and silt rich till or lacustrine deposits. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, monitoring wells installed in the unconsolidated fine grain sediments are the most challenging to develop. Why? Because these wells have a low groundwater yield. And if you remember early in the presentation, I said for water development, we want to move water in and out of the well screen, right? And if we have a really low groundwater yield, that's going to make that more challenging. And it's going to be difficult to remove finer grain material, fine sand, salt, and clay from the filter pack and adjacent formation if the formation doesn't produce a lot of water, right? And we've got to be really careful with clay and silt wells, wells and salt and, say, and mostly clay and silt, because if we generate through the well development activities, excessive silt and clay, that we may damage clog the filter pack. In other words, the silt may move out from the formation into the filter pack, and we may not be able to get it out. We may essentially reduce the permeability of our filter pack, which is a bad, a bad thing. Okay, next slide. Drilling method. Now, drilling method is going to affect the ability of the formation to produce representative groundwater samples to some extent. Uh, some drilling methods cause greater formation damage. Some drilling methods cause lesser, but the drilling method is always going to cause some formation alteration. Uh, methods that cause a greater formation damage would be augers or rotary, where we're going to shearing and smearing of the formation next to the well. Uh, rotary we might be injecting fluids or air. Those are problematic. Generally, we don't use that technique for monitoring wells or environmental wells for that reason, but sometimes in the past it was used a lot. Any, anymore, it's not. Uh, methods that cause lesser formation damage would be direct push and rotosonic, although they do still, still cause some damage and, and the need to develop a well installed using those techniques is still there. Uh, next slide. Monitoring well design. Uh, monitoring wells are typically more difficult to develop than water supply wells. Why? Well, they're small inside diameter casing and screen wells, generally two inches or less, and they're installed in lower yield saturated zones. So you've got a smaller well, which is going to produce less water in a lower yielding zone. So if I had my choice, if you told me, I've got two wells for you, I've got a monitoring well that's two inches in diameter, that's 50 foot deep with a five foot screen in silty sand, or I've got a 12 inch water supply well this screens 30 foot of sand and gravel, I would rather do the water supply well in terms of development. It might take a little bit longer because it's a larger well and we'd have to haul more development water away and sediment, but it would actually be easier, you know, technically. You'd, diff you'd have more trouble uh, and really get installing the smaller diameter well well. So that's something really to keep in mind. You know, we talk about things we borrow from the water supply industry, we borrowed from it, but, you know, they don't necessarily always exactly fit the way we'd like them to. Uh, the screen, the length and placement is going to depend on hydrogeology and regulatory program. Typically, our screens are less than 10 feet, and we're using 10-slot uh, screens or screens, PVC screens that have slots in them, which are 10 thousandths of an inch wide. That's not very large, but we are dealing with finer grain saturated zones. So that's what we typically do. Our filter packs, gradation should be appropriate for the screen slot size, which means 90% of the filter pack should be retained by the screen. Some of the filter pack can go through the screen into the well when we develop it. And a thickness greater than two inches for filter pack may increase, may require increased development effort. Now, generally a thickness of one and a half to two inches for a monitoring well, for a two inch monitoring well or a smaller monitoring well is just fine. If you try to put in larger thicknesses of uh, filter packs, say four inches, that's going to cause somewhat of a problem with development because what's going to happen is going to make, when you develop, you're not 
just not concerned with the filter pack. You're concerned with the formation around the filter pack. In a further away that formation is from the well screen, the harder it's going to be to affect it in terms of removing sediment and, and, gra and, and getting a proper gradation uh, that we would like to see around the well so that we have minimal head loss and we don't produce silly samples. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some examples of screens. On the left, you see the PVC two-inch screen we typically use for monitoring wells. Those are 10 slots screen, that's a 10 slot screen or 10 one thousandths of an inch. Uh, you can see the slots are very fine. On the right is more of a screen that would be used for let's say water supply. It has a, a stainless steel frame with a trap, uh, a, a triangular shaped wire that's wrapped around the frame. Now, one difference between these two screens is if you notice on the left, the, the plastic screen has slots cut in it. Uh, they cut in it with a saw or a machine, but they don't extend entirely around the screen itself. They're not continuous. Uh, the wire wrap screen is continuous. So the wire wrap screen would actually uh, produce more water or uh, in terms of development would be, would be an easier screen to work with than our PVC screen. My point here is here, the way your screen is constructed, the way it's made, the length of it is going to have an effect on the well development and how well your well development is going to work, how long it's going to take, those type of things. This is just for an example, another type of screen, it's called a louvered screen. These are for water supply wells they install out west in Nevada, where they have like alluvial fan deposits with boulders and, and, and very coarse gravel. Uh, basically, the slots allow the water in, the louvers keep uh, the coarser sediment out. But again, you know, developing something like this is gonna be a little bit different than, than, than using a wire wrap screen. Uh, next slide. So non-aqueous phase liquids, LNAPL or DNAPL, this is important. We want to make sure we check for the presence of NAPLs prior to water development. And some things that we probably should review or think about is, first of all, were petroleum products or solvents stored or used as property? Are they a potential problem in the subsurface? You know, as we're out there drilling, putting in the wells and the borings, we should be inspecting the downhole drilling equipment, cuttings, and core samples, especially for borings that we're going to put monitoring wells in. You know, if we notice that there's some NAPL in the subsurface, you know, uh, on a water table, a water level tape in a soil sample, uh, you know, at that point in time, we may want to make a decision not to install a monitoring well there or maybe install a well to do LNAPL recovery instead. Uh, you know, we should screen the water well column with an interface probe or clear baler. And we don't have to wait till the well's installed to do that. You could do that through augers, uh, or if you have a small enough baler, you know, even through maybe geoprobe rods, you could check and see if there's potentially an apple or, 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 or dean apple present. Th those are always good practices. Uh, next slide. And the reason we're concerned with this is uh, we would recommend not developing wells that, that contain NAPL because we want to avoid distributing the NAPL through the filter pack and screen formation interval. Uh, if you have NAPL coming in, say, at one foot in a one foot area or layer of a screen that it's 10 foot long, and you go in and you develop and you purge and you surge and you stir up the well, you're going to take that NAPL and you're going to distribute it through the entire filter pack and through the entire screen. It's really going to make a mess. And it's going to be hard to clean up. Then if you develop a well with NAPL in it, you're going to be generating a lot of contaminated purge water that's going to be, have to be containerized and dealt with. And basically, as I said, if, if you develop a well, let's say with LNAPL, and you go back and then you decide, well, I want to try to recover LNAPL from this well using an absorbent boom or some type of trap, it's going to make that all the more difficult. So if you know that the monitoring well has intercepted NAPL, the best thing to do is not develop. Next slide. So here's an example of some soil cores. These are probably geoprobe cores, and you can see there's a reddish brown fluid in the third core from the top. That is a dichlorobenzene. So I believe that's a DNAPL. And you know, if we saw something like this, you know, and we're going to install the well anyway, we would not want to develop the well. Because if you develop the well, what's going to happen? Let's say those those uh, lengths of cores are four feet, so we've got eight feet there total 
two core split, you're going to just distribute that material, that uh, dichlorobenzene through the whole interval. It's just going to make a mess. And, and, and like I said, if you wanted to use the water recover an apple, it just makes things harder. So it's it's best thing to do is if you're if you are going to install the well, use it for an apple recovery well. Uh, next slide. Other considerations we need to think about with well development are is the monitoring well use, groundwater quality versus hydraulic conductivity testing, for example. If we're going to collect groundwater quality samples, that might require a more rigorous, robust degree of envelopment than one than it would for hydraulic conductivity testing necessarily. Uh, in our cases, a lot of times we're using our monitoring wells maybe for collecting groundwater samples plus slug testing. So the groundwater quality would be the concern. Uh, regulatory requirements, you know, we need to think about those now. You know, our rules for VAP, our rules for solid waste, our rules for RECRA, they don't go into explicit detail about what we need to do during well development, but they do talk about representative samples, which is important. And that's kind of the thing we hang our hat on. And the Ohio EPA TGM, although it's not a rule itself, explains how to produce a representative sample. So if a consultant follows our TGM and they document the methods that we recommend, we can accept a sample as representative. If they don't follow TGM, which they don't have to, there's nothing that necessarily compels them to, except for the VAP, the VAP does reference it in, in I think rule seven. Uh, if they don't do that, then we have the right to ask a lot of questions about what they did to make sure we understand that they did produce a representative sample, or maybe they didn't, and they need to go back to the drawing board and start again. Well accessibility. You know, there's a big difference between poss possibly developing a well that's in a parking lot where you can drive up with a truck and, you know, unload your equipment very easily and get set up quickly versus a well that's in the middle of a cornfield, which is 100 yards from the nearest road where you have to carry all your equipment in. Uh, that might affect, you know, the type of equipment you use and the technique that you you uh, you use to develop the well. And also we got to think about purge water because we're going to have to have purge water. We're not going to really dump that out on the ground. We want to containerize it. And we, we're going to have to think about disposal options, right? Temporary storage and transportation. Uh, can we get permission to leave some drums at a site for a while until a transporter can pick them up? And, you know, as we're developing, the purge water is going to potentially be a concern for personal protective equipment. If we know the well has high levels uh, levels of VOCs, you know, we, we might want to have the appropriate equipment, you know, to protect ourselves. So those are all questions that should be asked before you go out to do the development. Okay, next slide. So the time interval between well installation and development, this is a big question because a lot of times, and I worked in consulting for about 12 years, so I, I remember this, you know, it's hurry up and get it done, hurry up and get it done, hurry up and get it done, and get it done yesterday. And there's a push, you did install a well and we wanna collect the samples right away. But, you know, uh, we're gonna do development and, should we do the development the same day we install the well? Well, that depends. You know, if we install a well where we've installed a grout, like a, a grout slurry, uh, to seal the well up, we might want to wait a day or two to let that grout slurry, slurry uh, consolidate. You know, otherwise, if we go out, let's say, if I put a well in and I had the well was 35 foot deep, and I had a 20 foot grout seal in it and I installed that grout as a grout slurry as a liquid grout. And I, as soon as the grout was installed, I started to develop, I might pull grout down into the sand pack, which would be a really, really bad situation that would ruin the well. Uh, now, if solid grouting materials are used like bentonite granules, there's less of a danger of this, of contaminating the filter pack and screen interval. But the point is we wanna make sure that when we install the well, we give the well sufficient time to settle, to solidify if we're dealing with grout uh, before we go in there and we start trying to pump water out of it or develop it. Next slide. 
So in our TGM, we recommend a 48-hour interval between well installation and development. Personally, in my experience, I've developed a lot of wells in the past when I was working in consultant. Uh, I, did, I did quite a few, everything from water supply wells down to very small monitoring wells. My preference would be would wait a week just to be on the safe side. Uh, uh, but, you know, shorter time frames might be justified based on the well construction grout types and conditions under which the grout was installed. If you have a well that's only like 15 foot deep and you essentially grouted it using bentonite pellets, which you hydrated, uh, developing it the next day or even later the same day may be an okay thing. But what you don't want to do is end up damaging the well because you developed it too early. That's the point. Next slide. So monitoring well development procedures. These alleviate formation damage and help improve groundwater sample quality. So there's three steps. We want to surge the well screen interval, which is push water back and through the screened interval so it comes in and out of the formation in the well. Now there's some exceptions to this. We'll talk about those in a minute. We want to remove purge water from the well by bailing or pumping. So as we're surging the screen in the sand pack and formation, uh, and sodium water is coming into the well, we're pulling that water out of the well by bailing or pumping. And as we're doing this, we want to monitor our stabilization criteria. We have criteria for stabilization that evaluates our effectiveness of the surging or removing purged water. So those three steps, those three things are what we're concerned with. Okay, next slide. Now, I want to make an important point here. The phrases well development and well purging are not synonyms. They're not the same thing. Uh, if you remove purge water without surging, you're not going to adequately develop the well installed in a coarse grain sediment or if it's in bedrock. Uh, you know, just going out and taking a baler and removing three well gallons and calling it a day is not good enough. Uh, there are some situations that may be all you can do, but they're not the norm. So, I mean, sometimes people get this idea or consultants get, well, you know, I don't need to surge and purge. I don't need to really uh, take stabilization criteria measurements. I just got to remove a little, little water before I sample. That's, that's not cutting it. That's, that's not what proper well development is. Uh, now, purging without surging might be appropriate well for salt and salt and clay. Uh, e even if I'm in salt and clay and I don't want to surge the well to avoid uh, creating a lot of salty sediment that could clog, clog the sand pack, as I talked about earlier. My development should always include measurement and evaluation of purge water stabilization criteria. So that's a must. So, you know, you, we shouldn't be seeing development records that don't have stabilization criteria with them. That's important that we be able to see that data and evaluate it. Next slide, please. Okay, as I've discussed, during surging, water is forced back and forth through the filter pack, and that optimizes the hydraulic interconnection between, between the well and the adjacent formation. By removing the fine sediment, you know, some of this might have been kicked up or created or loosened up through the well installation process, and grading and stabilizing the filter pack and surrounding formation, if I'm dealing with an unconsolidated material. With regard to surrounding formation, you really can't grade bedrock. Uh, next slide. Uh, we'll, yeah, we want to go for it. There we go. Uh, so next slide. Okay. Uh, as I said, surging is generally not recommended for wells installed in silts or clays because mobilization of the fine sediment can clog the filter pack. And surging in, in this situation is not necessarily going to improve the interconnection between the well and a silty or clay formation. It's, it's just not going to do what it would do with a sandy formation in terms of making the inter hydraulic interconnection better. Uh, next slide. Here's some surge blocks, and these are simply disc or cylinders that you attach to drilling rods, and they have a rubber gasket or a flat, and they fit kind of snugly against the side of the well. And you lower these things into the screen zone and you pull them up and down like a plunger and they push water out of the well into the formation and pull it back in, push it out and back in. And that's the surging process. Uh, you know, they make them for various size wells, like on the right, it looks like those blocks are for a four inch ID well and a two inch ID well. Next slide. Here's a couple more 
for examples, uh, the surge block on the left with a blue ring looks like it could be attached to a discharge line, you know, above a pump. So you could have your pump below that and, uh, you know, you could surge, that block will give you surging action in the screen interval. You also have uh, Watera inertial lift pumps, which are on the right, which uh, you can see there, the inertial lift pump is a little check of a ball with a check valve. Uh, and above it, you see kind of a plastic ring, that's the surge block. In the surge block, you can take off, so you can use the pump with or without the surge block. And these, the Watera uh, pumps are really effective. I really like them for developing monitoring wells. I think they work really well. Next slide. So when we talk about surging, this is what we want to achieve. If we look at the diagram on the left, if we move water back and forth across the sand pack and formation and well, what we're going to do is winnow out the fine sediments so that as we get closer to the well screen, the pore size increases. We get more permeability. There's more effective porosity. Why is this important? This is important because ideally, when we have a well and we're purging the well, we want the water to flow into the stream in a laminar fashion. We don't want turbulent flow. We want laminar flow. Laminar flow is always better. And also, this is going to make sure we have a good hydraulic interconnection so we're, we minimize the well loss uh, between the formation and the spring. So that's ideal. That's what we want to see. Now, if we just pump the well, if we pull just water into the well and call it development, what happens is this. As you can see, we don't get rid of the fine sediment next to the well screen. And what we do is create possibly sand or silt bridges where we're reducing the hydraulic conductivity, the effective porosity next to the screen. We don't want to do that because we're going to get well lost and we're going to reduce our degree of interconnection. So this is why surging back and forth is always better than pumping in one direction. Next slide, please. So here's a picture uh, from groundwater enrolls from Driscoll. And this is, shows us ideally what we would like to have after development. We have a continuous slot stainless steel well screen. And you can see we have coarse material next to it and finer material as we move out in the formation. Now this well looks like it was installed. Sometimes in sand and gravel, we install wells without, and this is okay for monitoring wells without a sand pack. And then you can just develop the formation around it. So here what they've done is by development pulled out the sand and fine silt and left the gravel surrounding the screen. So this, this is kind of the idea what we would like to have in every case, although sometimes we can't we, we can't really produce this. Uh, next slide. So well development criteria. When is development considered complete? Okay, in our Ohio EPA TGM after the following criteria are met. We want at least three times the standing water volume, the well in the filter pack, uh, in the well and filter pack removed. So, you know, what we would do is we would measure the depth of water in the well, calculate the water volume in the well itself, uh, calculate the water volume in the sand pack interval, and then we would want to remove three times that water volume from the well at a minimum for development. Now, I will say there are situations where you have very, very low yielding wells, where you might not be able to get three times the standing water volume, but that would need to be documented. So what's the next criteria? We want water quality parameters that have stabilized over at least three successive well volumes, temperature, pH, conductivity, DO, and RP, similar to sampling. Our purge water, we would like to have no sediment in it. We want it to be low turbidity, ideally under 10 NTUs. Uh, and we want the sediment thickness in the well to be less than 10% of the screen length. In other words, if we had a 10 foot screen and developed it, we wouldn't want to leave two foot of sediment in the screen. Uh, that's bad for a couple reasons. One, it would lead to increased turbidity possibly when we sample the well. Another is you're blocking part of the well screen so we wouldn't get, be getting a sample that's representative over that 10 feet from the formation. That would be a problem. Next slide, please. So turbidity is generally a big problem. We have something we tend to have a lot of trouble with because we do have a lot of silty and clay formations in Ohio. So what if we can't achieve the 10 NTUs or less? What do we do? Well, the first thing we want to do is verify that the well has been properly constructed. Look at the construction diagram 
And we also, a good idea is to look at purge water pH. If it's greater than nine, there may be grout contamination present in the filter pack and it's gonna be a bad day. And I say it's gonna be a bad day because if you grout contaminated well, we talked about this in a time interval between installation and development, not developing too quickly, you're gonna ruin the well. There, there's nothing you can really do once you get grout in the sand pack. And it's really, to me, a, a sample from a well like that's not representative. So we wanna make sure we don't have those kind of situations going on. So the next thing we would wanna consider is use another development method. Maybe we've tried a particular pump or surge block. Maybe we need to try something else, right? So another method should be employed to see if we can do better with turbidity. And if we do all that, and we can stabilize turbidity measurements within 10% over three successive well volumes, we would call it a day. In other words, if we use two development methods, the well was okay, uh, we got our turbidity measurements over three successive well volumes of say, uh, 49, 48, and 50 NTUs, that probably is what we're gonna be able to do. And there are some, there are some formations that are naturally silty, that naturally have a high turbidity, uh, that, that can occur. So we need to keep that in mind. We just need to do the best job that we can. Next slide, please. So other criteria to consider, uh, if we added fluids during willing, drilling or well installation, we want to try to remove those fluids from the subsurface. Why would we add fluids? Well, if you're sampling in sand, sometimes the sands will be under pressure. Like if you, let's say you drill through a confining unit with an auger and the, you know, the kind of confining unit's a till and you hit a sand below it and that sand's confined, what can happen with the augers is the sand can, 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 can migrate up into the augers. In other words, you can end up having four or five foot of sand in your auger, which is a problem with drilling and sampling. And what the drillers will do to, 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 to fix that sometimes is add water to the well itself and the weight of the water will push the sand back down into the formation, right? Uh, now we're using direct push technologies. I mean, this could still be a, a situation with a rotosonic scenario. Uh, but if we know for some reason we installed the well and we had to add fluids during the installation, we should try to purge out at least the volume of fluids added and an additional three well volumes is a good practice to try to make sure we re remove any effects we might have caused by our additions to the subsurface. Another thing to think about is is the well behaving as expected based on known hydrogeologic conditions, our static water level yield, level or yield or slug test results. Say we had four or five wells at a site, or let's say we had five wells, and they were all installed in the same formation. The, the, the construction diagrams for the wells are similar. There's no reason they should be dramatically different, but we have one well that has a static water level that's uh, four feet lower than the other wells. Well. We, we might want to go back to that well and ask the question, maybe one of the issues is we need a more robust development effort or something else is going on. Uh, but before we call it a day with development, and you know, I would say, you know, going even for wells that have been installed for a while, we're going to talk about redevelopment at the end of the, 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 the presentation, but development is something that should always be on the table, right? If you potentially have problems with a well, in other words, it's not a one and done scenario. I, I did my development when I installed the well and everything's good because conditions change over time. So we should always be open to going back to a site potentially and trying to correct what looks like a, a well that's gonna produce a non-representative sample by, by redeveloping. Next slide. So our water quality parameters are similar to those we measure during sampling. Uh, I, I won't go through them. Uh, those are what's in the TGM, and those are the uh, the current uh, numerical criteria, and they're basically the same as, as sampling. Okay, next slide, please. So the duration of well act development activities. How long should I develop? Well, it's going to vary with my well construction, my well diameter, screen length and size, type, slot size, my filter pack thickness. You know, a smaller diameter well, uh, if it produces uh, uh, sufficient water, might be uh, easier to develop 
than a larger diameter well, which produces more water. It just it's going to just depend on the scenario you've got. Uh, the water column height in the well will play a factor. The formation type, whether it's sand or gravel or silt, and the development method, all these things will come into play in terms of how long it's going to take you to get the well developed. Next slide. So adequate development may take less than two hours. It might take more than two days or even longer, but it should always be based on attaining water quality stabilization criteria. That's the key. Development duration by itself is not a criterion, okay? And sometimes what we hear from consultants is, well, gee, I went out and I took out 20 well volumes. Isn't that enough? Well, not if the stabilization criteria haven't been achieved. That's not enough. Uh, the number of well volumes beyond the three recommended by the TGM, which is kind of a minimum, is not a criterion for everything. It's just a number. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, and I know what happens is, in the consulting world, you'll have a job where you're putting in wells and you got to develop the wells and you have to have a cost estimate. So you have to have an estimated time to develop each well. So maybe you say two hours at a site and what hence happens is you go out and there's four wells that you know you can get within the two hour time frame, but one well maybe takes a little bit longer. Well, sometimes things don't get developed to the extent they should because of budgeting, cost estimate, you know, type concerns, but the fact of the matter is the cost can't override the fact we need a representative sample. So sometimes, you know, more efforts needed. Uh, and again, development duration is never a criterion in and of itself. Okay, next slide. So what development methods? We're going to talk about some methods. We're going to talk about what I call pre-development procedures, recommended methods for monitoring wells, surging and pumping, inertial lift pump, over pumping and bailing and want to note that whatever method we use should always be appropriate for the formation material screened. You know, we all should consider are we in bedrock, are we in sand and gravel, which is coarse and clean, are we in a silly sand, are we in a clay formation like a clay till or a lacustrine formation. Next slide. So pre-development, those would be activities performed before or during well installation to facilitate well development. And I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, I was installing a well in Astubula County, and it was in conjunction with a, a landfill that was going in. And the well was about 50 foot deep, and we drilled through probably 40 or so feet of till material, and then there was a silty sand which was on top of the shale bedrock, and the silty sand was the target for the well. So I think we installed a five foot screen. Uh, now, when we drilled down through that material with the augers, there was an upper saturated zone that, that made things wet, you know, and, and water uh, started to come in through that zone. And by the time we got down to the uh, target zone, to the silty sand on top of bedrock, and we were ready to start putting more materials in, we, we literally had a thick soup of silty water in the well, or in the boring itself, in the auger boring. So what we did was we got some barrels, or got some drums and took a baler, and we bail, bailed out that heavily silt-laden silt water and, and put it into the drums. And by doing this, we removed water, which really had a lot of silt and fine sand in it, uh, which helped us do a couple of things. One, cleaner water came in through our formation that we're gonna, we're gonna screen. And uh, when we put our screen and sand pack in, the water that, that they were settling out in the sand pack, you know, it didn't have as much silt in it and clay in it that we would have to remove during development after the well was, well was installed. In other words, what I'm saying here is sometimes if you can do it when you're installing a well, it's better to try to start your development a little bit early before you even have the well in place. It can save you time and grief and end up with a better, a better well uh, when you finish up. So, you know, uh, purging silty water generated from drilling from the or from the boring before installing the well as described. Another thing that's done in, in water supply wells, we used to do this. We put in the screen and filter pack and surge and purge before we put our grout in, right? That way the filter pack was nice and settled down and everything was, was cleaned out and the grout went on top of it. You know, because sometimes I know this happens with monitoring wells, you put in the sand pack and then you immediately put in the grout, maybe you put a, a, a bentonite pellet seal and then your grout. Well, later on, that sand may, may, may settle a little bit 
and you get a gap between your your, your seal and your sand pack or the seal slips down a little bit, which is not an ideal situation. It's not the end of the world, but it's better not for that to happen. So we get a better filter pack installation and less time needed for subsequent well development efforts. Next slide, please. Surging and pumping, typically we're gonna perform that with an electric submersible pump or bladder pump with or without a surge block. If we don't have a surge block and we're trying to surge, the pump must be of sufficient weight and diameter to accept, accept, effectively surge the well. And I will tell you, if somebody's using something like a, a Grunfuss Ready Flow 2 pump and they have a two inch well and they say they surged it, yeah, they did a little bit of surging action, but it probably wasn't all that effective. It probably wasn't nearly as effective as a surge block. Maybe they got 20% of where they needed to be. Uh, you know, a plastic pump is not gonna do a good job of surging. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, surging with a pump is kind of wishful thinking in most cases. Uh, the surge block can be attached to the pump or a separate assembly. So this technique we recommended for gravel, sand, or bedrock wells. We wouldn't ne necessarily recommend a lot of surging for walls and salt and silt and clay, as we've been talking about. Next slide. Inertial lift pump that consists of a ball valve connected to flexible tubing. A surge block is typically available as a separate attachment. We looked at that earlier. So water is purged from the well by lifting and dropping the pump in a continuous up and down motion. We do this manually or automatically. And this works just like a baler. The difference is a baler, you know, we drop the baler in, pull it out. We're like taking out the water in incremental increments where an inertial lift pump can provide a continuous discharge of purge water. Next slide. So the advantages are these are inexpensive, very inexpensive. They're portable, easy to carry around. They're very easy to operate. A third grader could do it. They work, work for small diameter wells. Maybe they're less than one inch very well. The disadvantages are slow. Uh, the surging can cause clogging filter packs installed in the finer formation, so you gotta be careful. They're really recommended for wells installed in bedrock, gravel, sand, soil, or clay, kind of across the spectrum, although we wouldn't surge in wells necessarily or surge a lot in wells installed in silver clay. And these work very well with direct push wells uh, with pre-packed screens. Next slide. So this is a diagram showing how the inertial lift pump works. So it's a check valve with a ball. So you lower the well into the, you lower the pump into the well, the tubing and, and the, with the pump assembly at the end. And the ball rises and uh, a column of water enters the tubing. You lift that tubing up, the ball drops, and it closes the valve off. Then you push the tubing down again, and you push more water into the tubing, pull it up, the valve, the valve stops the flow. So you're basically lifting the water out of the well. Why it's called an inertial lift pump by inertia. Okay, next slide. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the inertial lift pump. This is Watera. You can see there's the foot valve with the check ball in it uh, connected to the tubing on the left and on the right we have the surge block assembly which comes off and on you can put that off and on in the field uh, and, and these things are really easy to use they're easy to decant contaminate they can be really used they're very cost effective next slide and we have here you know you can do the surging by or, or the lifting and lowering of the casing by, by the discharge line by hand or you can use what's called the Watara hydro lift, that mechanism that's just a mechanical arm that moves the tubing up and down, you know, that does the, the that moves the pump so the ball goes up and down and you purge water out of the well. And you can see that works well. It's purging out a continuous flow of silty water into our bucket. Okay, next slide. Over pumping. Now, over pumping is a process of repeatedly pumping a well at a really high rate to induce a quick drawdown and then allowing the well to recover. And we generally perform that with an electrical submersible pump for larger wells, or we could do it with a peristaltic pump for smaller diameter wells. Next slide. Overpumping is going to remove fine sediments from the screen and filter pack, but it's not going to grade the filter pack. We're going to have unidirectional flow, one direction flow with no surging. And as we talked about and shown, that unidirectional flow can reduce the filter pack hydraulic conductivity. We'll get sand bridging next to the formation. We may actually reduce the hydraulic conductivity in the vicinity of the well screen a little bit. Uh, this is less effective than surging and pumping or an inertial lift pump for wells installed in bedrock, gravel, and sand. 
Now, where overpumping may be acceptable as well as installing salt and clay where we don't want to do a lot of surging. Uh, but I would not really consider it an acceptable technique in sand. I mean, if it's something that they can, they can surge to grade the filter pack and formation and remove fine material around the well, you're going to get a better well. Next slide, please. Bailing, that's lower and lifting a baler through a water column. That's going to surge the filter pack. Again, as with using a pump to surge the filter pack, you know, unless the baler is very close to the diameter of the well and very heavy, the surge action you get is not going to be the equivalent to that of a surge block. So, you know, it's kind of maybe in a lot of cases wishful thinking. Uh, if you're going to develop with a baler, the most effective uh, baler would be stainless steel because you need the weight of the baler. That will help surge. You might be able to fill the baler with a flange or disc to serve as a surge block. I've seen those before. And bailing is real effective at removing sediment from the bottom of the well. Like if you have a couple of feet of sediment in a two inch well and a stainless steel or baler, if you know what you're doing, within about 30 minutes, you can remove most of that sediment. So they work well for, for, for removing sediment that's settled out into the well. Next slide. Bailing is slow and labor intensive. Get ready for a workout depending on the depth of the well and the size of the baler. Uh, it's less effective than surging and pumping or inertial lift pumps for wells installed in bedrock gravel or sand. If you have wells installed in silt or clay, it's, you're better off using an inertial lift pump or over pumping, pumping as opposed to a baler. Uh, you know, problems with baler, you want to try to minimize surging and, and uh, have a continuous discharge if you can. Next slide, please. So here's a couple photos, and I just wanted to show this. Early on, I talked about the water supply world and how it affected the environmental industry in terms of techniques borrowed for water development. On the left, there's some cable tool rig, balers, and other tools. The two, if you go to your left, the pipe all the way to your left, uh, and the one, the next, not the next one over, but the, the third one over are balers. Those are big steel balers that you would use for water supply wells. And you would bail out maybe, I don't know, 50 gallons of water at a time, maybe 100 pounds of sediment potentially. And uh, what evolved from those with our typical stainless steel or baler you see on the right that we would use for, for monitoring wells. Uh, I just thought that was an interesting picture. Uh, you know, we kind of took these techniques that were used for water supply and we've had to adapt them, all right, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, next slide. So the following methods are discussed in Ohio's TGM, EPA's TGM, but they're more appropriate for water supply water development and monitoring water development. Backwashing and airlift pumping or surging. Okay, next slide. Now backwashing is also called raw hiding, and it's where you allow water that's been perched from the well to flow back through the pump intake and create a surging effect. So in other words, I would have a 55 gallon drum, let's say at the surface in an electrical submersible pump. I click my pump on, fill the drum up as fast as I could, then basically let the water from the drum flow back into the discharge line down through the pump. So it would create a surging action through the screen by adding water back to the well. Water would be going into the screen, out of the screen as I pumped it and let water flow back into it. There's some issues with that. First of all, you could preferentially, preferentially develop the top of the screen to more, more permeable zones. So you might not develop your formation, your screen interval to the same degree all along the interval. You might prefer, preferentially develop some zones, but not others, and that's not good. And if we have contaminated groundwater, this is just not an appropriate practice. We would, we would never do this at a, a, a has waste site or a landfill site. So it's something that shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't be concerned with, with monitoring models. Next slide, please. Airlift pumping and air surging, that's well developed by air injection. It's effective at removing fine sediment. It's not very effective at surging the filter pack. Next slide. Uh, airlift pumping and surging can affect, adversely affect groundwater quality due to volatilization and oxidation of COCs. I mean, if we're blowing water, air into the water, you know, we're adding oxygen, we're, that's going to tend to do a lot of things we would prefer not be done to our groundwater, especially before we sample it. And then there's always a, 
risk that we're going to get contamination from the air compressor, such as oil. There's health and safety concerns. You know, if the grower is contaminated and we're bubbling air through it and that's coming out at the top of the well casing, we can expose field personnel to hazardous substances such as VOCs, which is not a good practice. Next slide. So this is an, an, an example of airlift surging or pumping. We've got an airline in the well and we're blasting the water out of the well. Uh, sometimes there's tools where you can jet the formation or jet the screen. But again, when we're talking contaminated sites and monitoring wells that we're going to be used for, they're going to be used for uh, to collect samples for to evaluate risk or something like that. This is not something we probably want to do the well before we sample it. Uh, next slide. And here's a diagram showing air lifting. We have an airline that goes into the well, a footpiece, which is kind of a U-shaped tube, which goes into a, a casing installed in the well. Uh, we blow air into the casing and the bubbles go to the surface. They lift the water out of the well. And that's how airlift pumping works. Next slide. So well development documentation, what do we need? Well, there should have a well development field form when we develop a well. And this is really important documentation because it demonstrates demonstrates the well is ready to produce representative groundwater samples. And it, it, it really, I, I sometimes just don't understand. You know, nothing we've talked about with water development here is rocket science. I mean, this isn't highly technical risk assessment or calculus. I mean, the techniques, the, the activities, the equipment are fairly straightforward. I mean, this should be easy. But yet, there's so many sites I've seen in situations where people don't document their well development or they don't do a good job of documenting it. And to me, it just, it, it's really a shame. It just wastes money and sets you up for future problems. Uh, these forms provide a lot of useful information for future reference. For example, selecting sampling methods. I mean, if I had a site that I didn't know about, that, that I had no experience with and I was asked to do groundwater sampling, the first thing I would go to would be the well development records to see well, how did these wells develop? How, what did they pump out of them? Are they silty? Are there turbidity problems? Uh, you know, everything along those lines so that when I picked the sampling method, it would be the most appropriate. If we have problems with a well, we can use the well development record as a tool to help address and resolve sampling concerns or concerns with the well and especially evaluating the need for what redevelopment, right? If the well's behaving funny, maybe it seems to get more turbid, samples get more turbid as we go on, we look at the well development record and see, well, gee, the turbidity was fine back when we developed it two years ago. Maybe we need to do this again. So this is why these forms are important. Next slide, please. So information on the forms typically is gonna include well construction details and development methods used, our water level data, at least the initial and final water levels, the volume of water purge and estimated purge rate, our stabilization, stabilization parameter, parameter measurements and observations, like purge water clarity, sediment removal, odor, et cetera. Next slide. So here's an example of one of Dura's monitoring well development forms. This was SIFU, Dura SIFU. They were out sampling monitoring wells in Cincinnati. And this is the development form. You can see they've got the site name, well ID, who sampled it, the well diameter, the depth, depth to water, uh, other information. You can see we have the well method. They're using a water inertial lift pump. They note that they put a surge block on it at a point. Our date, our time, volume of water purged, you know, over, uh, uh, over time. Uh, our water levels, they were checking water levels in the well, and they also estimated the purge rate in gallons per minute. So, you know, right now I know, gee, look at this. My purge rate is about 1,600 milliliters a minute. It looks like a minute, yeah. And I didn't get much, I'm not getting much drawdown in the well. I mean, my well's close to static. So that tells me I could pump the well at least this rate for sampling and not really induce much drawdown in it. We have our temperature, pH, specific inductance, turbidity, and, uh, and other measurements that we want, meters that we might want to use to collect water quality measurements. And then we note characteristics of the water. It's color, potentially odor, uh, you know, whether there's a lot of sediment in it or not. Uh, so this is an example of the type of information that should be collected when we're development in a type of form that should be retained and used throughout the life of the monitoring well. Next slide, please. 
So we've done our well development, now we want to sample. So the question comes up, how long should we wait between well development and sampling? What should the time interval be? Well, it's going to depend on the following factors. First, your hydrogeologic conditions. What is the well installed in? What's the saturated zone like? Our drilling methodology and well construction, our well development methodology, and our regulatory program and data quality objectives are important also. Next slide. Okay, prior to sampling a newly developed or redeveloped well, we need to consider two criteria. Have we attained physical equilibrium? In other words, has the well returned to true static water level, which is not too hard to determine if you have a water level tank. Then we've got to think about chemical equilibrium. Is the water in the well in equilibrium chemically with water in the formation? Is it representative? That may be a little bit more difficult to determine, and that's in fact why we purge wells before we sample them to make sure that's the case. Next slide. But the TGM recommends the following post-development time intervals prior to groundwater sample collection. Uh, if we have a, a shallow well that's less than 25 feet below ground surface, a small diameter, maybe it's two inch or one inch, we installed it using direct push methods, so we didn't do a lot of formation damage. Uh, we should wait at least 24 hours. In other words, we develop one day, the next day, 25 hours later, we can go ahead and sample it. And that 24 hours is just the time needed to make sure that the well kind of comes back into equilibration with the formation is ready to sample. Now, if we have deeper wells, say we have 25 to 50 feet deep wells, and they could be start installed with larger diameter direct push or augers or rotary drilling methods. We would suggest, or, or maybe these wells were, were larger wells, four inch ID as opposed to two. We would suggest 72 hours for those wells, a period. In other words, maybe you finish your development on a Monday, then you would sample on a Thursday. Now, if we've got really deep wells or less than 50 feet deep, you know, upwards of 100 feet in bedrock, or, or deep unconsolidated set sediments, we would recommend a week, seven days, between well development and sampling. And why is this? Next slide, please. How did we come up with the, these criteria? Well, if you go out and you look for references, you're not going to find a lot of published information on well development. Things haven't changed much over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, but Wells installed in silt clear shale may require a longer post-development stabilization period than wells installed in gravel, sand, or more permeable bedrock types. And the deeper the well is, the larger the well is, the more damage we did during drilling, uh, you know, when we develop, uh, we, we probably want to give the well a little bit more time before we sample it to make sure everything's stabilized and, and is ready to go in terms of sampling. Next slide, please. So well redevelopment, we periodically need to ensure that monitoring wells are producing representative groundwater samples. Uh, so what are the indicators of redevelopment? Well, I have six here, and these six are ordered in what I would consider, at least from my time at Ohio EPA, the most common reason for redeveloping a well. So what's the first reason that we run into? Well, we've got wells that haven't been sampled for greater than two years, and we don't have development records available. So we get a site or a consultant gets a site, there's no development records, they don't know if the wells were developed, or maybe the wells haven't been developed, sampled for five years. You know, if we're looking at an order of five years, I would say you probably need to redevelop. Uh, two to five years, it depends. I mean, some wells can, you can redevelop them and sample them and it can be fine for 10 years or so. Other wells, you know, they can start having issues after a uh, may maybe one year. But that, that reason comes up a lot. The second reason is increased groundwater turbidity observed during sampling, okay? In other words, we have maybe semi-annual sampling events and we noticed we with a well, every time we go out, the turbidity gets harder to minimize. It seems to be increasing. That may indicate we need to do some development or redevelopment. We start seeing sediment thickness greater than 10% of the screen length being present. If we have a five foot screen and I start to see sediment more than a thickness more of more than one foot accumulating a well, again, that may be an indicator of redevelopment. We've got a partially blocked well screen. Do the roots or bacteria growth in the well itself? 
uh, our well yield or specific capacity starts decreasing between sampling events. For some reason, the well is not producing as much water over time. Or we notice the static water level begins to decline over time. These are all reasons for redeveloping. Next slide, please. So this is a, a screen. It's a stainless steel wire wrap screen. It could be out of a water supply well. It could be out of a remediation well. But what happens over time is we're going to get fouling of the screen. We're going to get bacterial and biofilms and growths that precipitate out things like iron oxide and mag manganese, and they're going to clog the screen up. Uh, so we've got to do something about that. That's going to be a problem. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the tools we've got, we have two of these at Ohio EPA, is a well camera that we can use to inspect wells to evaluate, you know, look at the screen interval and see, do we need to develop, develop are, there, are there conditions that we can't see from the subsurface uh, that we can see with the camera? And here we have Duracifu's camera set up. You can see there's a tripod which holds the camera, which is in the well, and that's connected to a controller box, which we can videotape, or we can, we can, we can record a videotape in the controller box. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another picture of uh, the uh, the camera looking down. This well is kind of a larger well. It looks like a six or eight inch well. You can see the camera is hanging inside the well at the bottom. Above it is a counterbalance type weight. You can see the leg of the tripod and the camera reel. So we're lowering this into the well to take a video. Next slide, please. Oh, there's a picture of the camera itself. It's like a 360 degree lens that you see 360 degrees. You see the lens there, and also you see uh, the LED lights around the lens that light up the well itself. That's what the camera looks like. Next slide, please. So here's the inside of the well, and this is actually above the water level. I don't know if you can tell, it depends. Uh, you can kind of see the, the contact between the water level in the casing. So the casing's fairly clean here. Uh, this is what we're looking for. So what we want to do then is to be able to investigate a well with the camera to see what we can see. Next slide, please. And we're going to try to use a YouTube video here of a well cam in action. It's very short. I'll kind of narrate. Hopefully this will work. So it's time for the video. This is only about a minute. So here we have the camera going into the well. There's the, we're coming down to the water level. We just passed a joint in the well. Now there's the water level. That's a static water level in the well. So they're down inside the well now. They're below the static water level. For some reason, they're lifting the camera up and down out of the, out of the water. I don't know why. But here we are inside the well, and you can see the slots on the screen. This is inside the screen, and there's sediment at the bottom of the well, right? So now they've got this switched on in a way. They've got a camera that views the sidewall also. So you're looking at the sidewall of the well, and you can kind of look at the quality of the, the screen slots. So there's a 10 slot screens we talked about. Those look in good condition, right? And to think about when you're moving water in and out of the well, you're moving it through those fine screen slots. So that was video. Uh, so I wanted everybody to be able to see what, what that kind of looked like. We'll go back to the PowerPoint presentation now for the next slide. So I got some photos from their CIFO. Uh, these are wells that we've actually taken videos, videos of to check out, in some cases before we were going to redevelop them or to determine if we're going to redevelop. Now, here we have a monitoring well. It's two inch, 10 slot. We're inside the screen. We've got a lot of biofilm or growth, algae bacteria on the screen slots. You know, and you probably wouldn't want to collect a sample from that in that condition. So the development would remove that type of material. And if there was excess sediment at the bottom, we would take it out. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is even worse. Uh, we've got iron bacteria. This is stuff that's kind of fluorescent on the sides of the screen. Uh, you know, also biological growth. 
This one definitely is, if we saw this condition, you would want to clean out this well before you resampled it. And this is why we do well, well, well development and redevelopment. This is why it's important. Next slide, please. Here we've got roots in a well. There were trees, large trees next to the, these wells, and the tree roots actually grew through the screen, penetrated the screen or the well, and are inside the well itself. So uh, these things had to be removed. I mean, and in some cases, you know, you might have a situation where you have a problem like this obstruction where you can't remove it. But uh, this is the value of having a camera, uh, the, 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 these videos as a tool especially for inspecting wells before we're going to sample them or determine well redevelopment. Next slide, please. Well, here's an example of, again, we've got some bio, biological growth on the screen slots. And the biological growth, the bacteria and the, and the algae and stuff like to grow there because that's where the water flows into the well, in and out of the well. So that's where they like to attach so they can get all their nutrients. And here we've got sediment at the bottom. So, you know, if this was just a little bit of sediment, it wouldn't be a big deal. If it was like, say, two foot of sediment and a five foot screen, we would want to remove it. But something to think about is when you put a baler down in a well like this to sample, you're not going to be able to sample without stirring up that sediment and making the water turbid or a pump. And this is where low flow of pumping comes in is important because, you know, if I had to sample this well as is, if I used a low flow technique, I probably could get a non a low turbid sample you know, pumping at a rate of 100 milliliters per minute, but I'm not going to do that with an electric submersible pump or a baler. Uh, next slide, please. So the last thing I want to talk about, I just want to mention this in terms of, you know, uh, determining whether a well needs redevelopment. Uh, cameras, downhole cameras are certainly one tool we can use. Another tool we can use is specific capacity, and that's just the quantity of water that a well can produce per unit of drawdown. So specific capacity, it's in gallons per minute per foot equals your pumping rate in gallons per minute my, over your drawdown. And it's going to depend on the pumping rate, but it's going to decrease as the pumping rate increases because what happens is as I increase, increase the pumping rate, the drawdown is going to increase to a greater degree. So the, the denominator is going to uh, become bigger, faster than the numerator, so to speak. Uh, in this measurement, useful for comparing the efficiency of a well over time and evaluating the need for well redevelopment. And on the next slide, we graphically show that on the next slide. So here's a graph of well redevelopment. Say we have a well, and this would be not be so common for a monitoring well, but more common for a water supply well or remediation well. We put the well in back around 1970. It had a specific capacity of, say, 130 gallons per minute per foot. And by in five years, that dropped down to maybe 65 because the well screen got clogged. You know, there was things going on in the formation or around the well in the sand pack, maybe got sealed it up a little bit. I go in there and I redevelop, right? And I recover my specific capacity to somewhat. I recover to maybe 115 or 117 gallons per minute per foot. But you notice I'm not all the way back to where I was in 1970. And that process continues. And each time I redevelop, I can make things better. But a lot of times, you know, when you're looking, especially at larger diameter pumping wells, over the long term, you may have a loss of specific capacity that you can't correct by redevelopment. And this is because there may be things going on outside in the formation of the effects of other pumping wells. Uh, you know, the bacteria growth and stuff that we've shown inside the wells in the pictures, that also can occur outside in the formation. So it may be outside in the formation at a distance from the well you can't affect, that you can't clean up. So again, this is not something that's common with monitoring wells, but I just wanted to throw it out there. I wanted to present a couple slides on it so we're aware of it. And we can go to the next slide. And that's the end of the presentation. Any questions or comments? Thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate it. So it's a great presentation. What do you think about working the upper, middle, and lower portions of 10-foot screens and longer to gain perimeter stabilization, especially if the well will be used for aquifer testing? I actually think that's a great idea. And actually, you know, that's something you do these presentations. I haven't heard that. If I redid this again, I probably would add a comment in the presentation on that. 
but that is true, you know, because I was generally thinking about smaller screens that we would use for monitoring walls, five or 10 feet. But if you do have a screen that's long, you know, you're looking at aqua testing, uh, it is a good practice to maybe you start out with the, the top of the screen, you develop it, surge it, then you move down to the mid portion of the screen and develop it, then the lower portion of the screen. That's a great practice as opposed to trying to do just one. You definitely wouldn't want to do just one area of the screen and it might be difficult to try to do the whole screen at once, right? And in fact, the danger with trying to do the whole screen at once would be, you know, sometimes if it's a coarse grain formation with loose sand, a lot of material will come into the well quick when you're surging. And if that happens too fast, you could actually sand lock a pump or surge block in the well, which would be really bad. You know, that would be a bad day. So that is a great comment and observation, and I agree 100%. Okay, I guess that concludes our session. If anybody else um, has any more questions and they pop up afterwards, I can also forward those along to Jeff as well. Thank you guys so much for joining.